How's everybody tonight? Besides dry, and that's always a good thing. Well, I'm Larry Cotler from KX. You know, you can hear my show uh, Monday through Friday mornings from 6 to 9. And um, also, I'm sorry, Paul, I'm the voice of the Drake Bulldogs. Oh, so that's is acceptable. That okay? I'm fine. That's I'm an okay. equal opportunity guy. There you go. I appreciate that. It was fun walking in in front of Paul, like Mutt and Jeff. <laughs> it's great. But uh, no, I, I haven't known Paul that long because I wasn't actually living in Iowa at the time. I was in Chicago when Paul was playing at Iowa State. But, you know, I obviously kept up with the Cyclones during that period of time. And actually, he's one of the, you know, a lot of Iowa, or several Iowa players went to Kansas. And you're one who went the other way. You came from Kansas up to Iowa. But he came up to Iowa State and he played ball for Tim Floyd and Larry Eustachian. Of course, those are some terrific teams. And then he went on to play for dot, 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 dot. And that's why we're here because I don't know if you've had a chance to read his book. It's, ter it's a terrific read. I first interviewed Paul when he was blogging. You were with the Phoenix Suns and you were blogging. And uh, that was great stuff. And I'm not going to take much, any more of your time because I want to tell you something. This guy is terrific. I've had him on my show about three times now. He has a great story to tell you. And it's the life of glamour and glory. Because <laughs> everybody thinks that a professional athlete's life is just that. It's a glamorous life. And Paul Shirley is going to tell you all about it. Here's Paul. Okay, as you can tell, I'm kind of tall, so you don't have to worry about the stage anymore. Plus, I have sort of a case of attention deficit disorder, and if I sit there for very long, especially after coming from Spain two nights ago in my jet-lagged mind, I might fall asleep, and so might you, and that's, that's not good for anybody. Um, so, uh, so here's the thing. I'm neither an author nor a public speaker by trade, so if anybody has any suggestions for how I can do this better, feel free to tell me, and then I will ignore them. But <laughs> I want you to know that, that there is no, there's no like formal, I'm not going to stand up here and come up with some speech that's going to change your life. So as we're going, I want you to, to think of some questions because I'm a really dumb professional athlete and my brain isn't, isn't that clever and smart that I can come up with a whole speech for you. So I'm going to need your help to kind of get me started, especially after this huge dinner that, uh, that Jan was fortunate or nice enough to treat me to at this little French restaurant that she recommended. I'm a little slow right now. And also, I should add that I kind of have a little bit of a cold, which means that I've been taking some cold medicine. There's this great comedian named Mitch Hedberg that probably no one in here knows. Oh, we got two nods. <laughs> Mitch Hedberg is now dead from a drug overdose. But the cool thing about listening to his, his shows is that you can listen to live shows and kind of tell which drug he's on based on how he talks. Like, if he's on cocaine, then he's talking really fast, and you, but if he's on, like, marijuana, then everything is really slow. I'm on some Benadryl right now, so I'm not really sure what that does. I mean, like, my, my voice to me sounds normal, but to you it might be sounding really, like, RPM 22, I'm not sure. So anyway, if you need me to, like, pick it up or slow it down, let me know. And also, if you can't hear something or you want to just uh, run up and punch me in the stomach, then we can do that. It's fine. Whatever. There's no, like, this is free-flowing at best. Um, all right, so I'm here because I wrote uh, this book. Uh, can, can I use that real quick? Yeah, okay. Just so everybody knows, this is what my book looks like. Great. Now we're done with that. Um, let's, talk, let's talk how the book started because, again, I don't really have any training in writing. My degree is in engineering from Iowa State. The only training I got in writing was reading a lot. As a kid, I started off reading about 72% of the Hardy Boys books that they ever wrote. Anybody? Who Name the author of the Hardy Boys books. Go. Somebody. Very good. Franklin W. Dixon. You win. Sorry, nothing. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, so the way that I learned to write, quote unquote, is by reading a lot. Um, and, and the one thing that I've learned about writing is that a lot of the times if I get stuck with something, I have to kind of start at the beginning. That makes the most sense. When I graduated from the esteemed Iowa State University, sorry, I just recognized Beth Haig, uh, who I've known for a long time, who did sports information for us, and I apologize. Again, not a polished public speaker. I get distracted easily. So don't take your top off or anything. I'm going to <laughs> screw me up. Um, so anyway, I started writing because when I first went to Greece coming out of college, I did not have a lot of internet access. 
and I was lazy and kind of cheap, so I did the whole like, oh, this is Paul checking in, and I would send a bulk email to all my friends and family with what had happened that week. And over the course of the next three or four years, I kind of developed a little shtick, like people sort of enjoyed my self-effacing, some would say slightly neurotic and uh, maybe self-destructive uh, commentary on my life. So I, I did this for a while and at the time assumed that I would someday write a book or at least compile these things into a book, but never thought that I would do it during my career. Then by some twist of fortune, the Phoenix Suns decided that they didn't have enough 6'10 white guys from Kansas on their bench to cheer <laughs> and they signed me to a contract. So I went to Phoenix and while I was there, I didn't have anything else to do as I mentioned. I was basically just clapping and looking pretty. So. <laughs> The, the internet guys there said, hey, why don't you jot down some notes for us and we'll post it as a blog. This is way back in 2005 when people didn't really know what a blog was yet, so it was like a revolutionary idea. Let's have a basketball player talk about his life. That'll be funny. Um, <laughs> they didn't actually think that I was going to write like full on columns. They thought I would just send them like, today had food, it good, <laughs> next day fun. But I, again, had read a couple of books in my life and like had built up this, like as I said, this kind of persona as, as how I wrote for my friends and family. So basically walked into a pretty good situation. Like I already knew what I was going to do, knew that I could do this sort of thing if I needed to. And I also knew that this was a pretty good opportunity because I had always wanted to write a book. And you know, if I was able to get this out on the web and, and do it pretty well, then maybe someday I would get to do that. So I write this thing and you know, I'm talking about Steve Nash, and at the time the Phoenix Suns were really good, 62 and 20 that year, which I had absolutely nothing to do with. Like, <laughs> in fact, they probably would have been 63 and 19, except for me, I'm not sure. Like, I didn't have, I helped in no way. Although, I, I don't know, I guess I say that, but I was pretty good at like playing horse against some of the starters before the game, so maybe I actually contributed like to half a win or something. Um, so this goes pretty well. Bill Simmons, who writes for ESPN.com, noticed my blog and referred some people to it, which kind of, again, developed a little bit of a groundswell, if you will. Uh, the Wall Street Journal interviewed me. There were like several people kind of gaining interest in this. Along about that time, Random House calls and says, you know, they actually said this to my basketball agent, who then kind of tried to weasel in because he had a book idea of his own wanted to get published. So he's like, well, by the way, I'd like to write a book too. So that meant that I needed to go get a different agent for book stuff. <laughs> Random House calls him and says, hey, would Paul ever want to write a book? And uh, my agent says, I, I don't know, but I do. And so then he called me and said, oh, and by the way, this company called Random House called. I don't know if you've heard of them and they want you to write a book or something. So I got a literary agent, which is ridiculous, I know, for a, you know, a guy from a town of 700 people in Kansas, but it's true because that's what you have to do. And so then I started churning out that book and now here we are. It came out in hardcover May 15th of last year, I think, and softcover this year. By the way, sorry about buying the hardcover. That's too bad because you had to pay like 24 and it was <laughs> like 10 now. Well, somebody, somebody in your household is poorer, like $14 poorer because of the paper, but that, that's those tricky publishing houses, I tell you. By the way, I learned this recently. Um, I'll go ahead, if you have any questions about like publishing, writing, I can blow the myths out of the water if you like. Or I'm sure that these are probably like insider secrets, but whatever. You know how you go into a bookstore, right? And like at the beginning, at the front of the bookstore, there are all these books and you assume that those are the best sellers or like staff picks or whatever. Well, it turns out that the publishing houses a lot of times pay to have those put at the front which is, this doesn't seem right to me. I feel like someone should be in charge of that that's not you know, paying someone else, but say I love you, that's the way it goes. Um, and scene, where are we next? Um, who has a question? To, to ask me a question and then, because again, I'm pretty stupid, I'll just sort of roll from there. Talk back there. Um, who are you thinking in the final year? <laughs> 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 we, we, this, I feel like this is, we have, two, we have two defined groups here. We have readers and we have sports people. I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid this is one of the sports people, readers. Yeah, so in the finals, I don't prognosticate. I'm interested because it's the, the Celtics versus the Lakers and I grew up watching Larry Bird like every other white person in the Midwest. So 
I'm kind of rooting for the Celtics, also because I went to training camp with both the Timberwolves and with the Lakers, and Kevin Garnett is one of the most impressive, distinguished human beings I've ever been around on the basketball court, and Kobe Bryant is not. So, <laughs> I have, I have, <laughs> wow, I didn't know there was so much anti-Kobe Bryant sentiment in the air, jeez. Note to self, always go back to Kobe Bryant hatred <laughs> jokes if the thing gets dead. Uh, so I'm kind of, I'm hoping that the Celtics will win just because Kevin Garnett's a pretty cool, good, pretty cool dude and I like those guys. It has been interesting meeting so many personalities in my career. I've been around cool people, m more not so cool people unfortunately, which is a sad truth and one of the maybe flaws of my book. People, when they write in on Amazon.com, for example, on Amazon, anyone can review your book. Like, if you read the book and you know how to type, you can type whatever you want about Paul Shirley's book, which can be a little great, but it can also be a little annoying because somebody may have some like personal vendetta about something I said on page 47 and just want to like spout off about it. In these Amazon reviews, and, and I've noticed this before, people say, well, why do you complain so much about your life? Like, it's pretty cool. You're a professional athlete. You get paid to put a small ball into a hoop. Like, things could be worse, right? <laughs> well, I think part of the reason that I complain a lot is because I, writing for me is very cathartic. Like, I do it when times are tough. It's, it's kind of my own little release. So a lot of times, when I was writing something that later appeared in the book, it was because I was mad about something Something, some coach had done something I didn't like, or some team had, in my mind, screwed me over, or whatever. And so, for me, a lot of the stuff that goes into there is, is kind of negative energy. I'm not like that all the time. Like, sometimes I'm pretty happy. It's the other, you know, 22 <laughs> hours of the day that are the problem. Uh, so, so, anyway, like, that can, that can be a little frustrating, just that the idea was, when I, when I wrote most of this stuff, I wasn't really thinking, how is this going to be turned into a book? But here we are, it's a book, and I can't do much about it now. It's all, it's all down on the paper, and that's life. So what I was leading to, there have been really cool people that I've met along the way, but it's not that interesting to write like, Kevin Garnett is really fun, and we hung out and talked about our meal tonight. Like, it's more interesting to talk about the guys that piss you off, because that's just the way of things. Like, that's, where, that's how great authors are made, generally. Not that I'm one of them, but Great authors had someone abuse them or their dad was an alcoholic or whatever, and their life was just terrible. But it's fun to read about for us because like our lives are pretty normal and so like that pain causes a lot of like interesting writing. I will say that there are some some cool people, and I'll tell you like a little name dropping story now. I went to training camp with the Lakers my first year out of school, and um, Kobe Bryant, as I mentioned, not one of my favorite people, but Shaquille O'Neal, just amazing human being which is kind of refreshing. Like, like, most of these guys, most professional basketball players at a really high level, aren't like the rest of us. I mean, I'm not completely like you. Like, I'm obviously pretty good at basketball, and that makes me sort of arrogant in a way. Like, you have to be a little more self-confident than maybe the next guy to stand in front of 15,000 people and make a free throw. But I also was raised, like, to be self-critical, and which has caused me problems, because then I think about, well, I could miss this free throw, and then, like, all of these people are going to boo me, and at the same time, my pants are going to fall down, my girlfriend's going to leave me, and then I'm going to end up like the, the fate of Edgar Allan Poe dying in the streets of syphilis or something. I don't think, like, Kobe Bryant thinks those things. Like, that's <laughs> the difference between he and I. But there are the rare exceptions of guys who are super high-level athletes, but also, like, really good guys. Steve Nash, for example. But back to Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal, the first time I'm, I'm around him, I'm, I walk to the, the Lakers facility. Well, that sounds, sounds kind of like a misnomer. I didn't, they did buy a plane ticket. I wasn't so bad that they made me walk <laughs> from Kansas to Los Angeles. But first day of practice, I come in late because basically my agent had to like kill someone to get them to sign me, I think. But, I, I arrive late, I have to get my physical and, and all of these other things, and I walk into the locker room for media day, and there on the wall is my jersey with my name on it, which is pretty damn cool. Like, even at Iowa State, which is 
not the Lakers. It was great, but it's not the Lakers. I would still get that feeling of walking in and there's your jersey with Shirley on, my jersey, not your, Shirley with 45 on the back. Like, that's pretty cool. But then to have it with a Los Angeles Lakers, granted I hated the Lakers from my childhood, but still, <laughs> pretty cool. So I'm kind of like, well, I'm just this kid from Kansas, a pop town population 700, like what am I doing here? But kind of decided at that moment, like let's be a little different Paul here, let's have some guts and maybe just act differently than old shy Paul would have. So I march up to Shaquille O'Neal. By the way, I, I know this is in the book, so if you read it, nah, too bad, sorry. <laughs> let's just deal with it. Uh, so I walk up to Shaquille O'Neal and I'm like, hi, uh, my name's Paul Shirley, it's nice to meet you. And he said, hey, it's Shaq, man, and I know who you are, so don't worry about it. And I nearly like <laughs> fell on the floor, like Shaquille O'Neal says that he knows my name. He probably didn't know my name. He was just being nice. But people in the world of basketball aren't ever nice. It's just, they're never nice. No, ever, ever nice. Like, whenever I've played pickup basketball games or practice, like there's this attitude that if I show any weakness by saying that sometimes I think I might miss a shot, like that the piranhas will attack and then you're never going to be allowed to play on the court again. Which is just not how I ever envisioned basketball. When I was a kid, I read a lot, as I mentioned. I was sort of a dork, didn't have a lot of dates, as you can imagine. Readers, not big date getters, shocking news. <laughs> so I read and read and read and read. And the highlight of our weeks was we got to go to the Topeka Public Library where it was air conditioned and my mother wasn't yelling at us to like go snap peas or something like that. Like we actually got to relax for a little while. So I read lots of biographies and I would read about like Mickey Mantle and I was a big baseball guy until I broke my nose, a different story for a different day. But my nose is a lot wider than it used to be, which is unfortunate for my girlfriend because she has to deal with like ugly Paul now. Anyway, <laughs> so read lots of biographies about these baseball players and I would read like, well, the 27 Yankees would play the game and then all go out together and eat dinner and chase girls together and all this. And that's kind of how I imagine professional sports to be. It's not like that at all. College sports aren't even really like that. I mean, we had guys at, at Iowa State who could Jamal Tinsley, for example, didn't graduate from high school. I mean, he and I, my, my dad has a PhD from University of Kansas. Like, he and I don't have the same things to talk about. Same with some of the dudes in the NBA. There's these guys like Eddie Curry or Tyson Chandler who were playing for the Chicago Bulls when I was there, who probably couldn't spell SAT. I mean, they <laughs> struggle with, like, having a conversation about the things I want to talk about. They don't know, for example, what 4-H is, and I do because I was in 4-H. Some of you probably don't know what 4-H is, but <laughs> it's for farmers and dorks, again, like me. <laughs> so there, there, it hasn't ever been quite what I expected out of this life that I was going to lead. Like, and I, again, in all seriousness, I think this is sort of a problem with professional sports. I think people would relate better to the NBA if they thought these guys actually got along. But when you see guys screaming at each other on the court, you think, well, they probably aren't like hanging out at barbecues after the game. <laughs> and that's too bad, because I think we all want to imagine that professional sports is like the sports we played at whatever level was your maximum, whether it was when you were in high school or college or when you were seven and ran to third base instead of first base. Like, we all want it to be that pure thing. For me, this is kind of something that I'm always trying to crack. Like, why do fans watch sports? Because I don't care now about sports because I've seen kind of what happens in the circus. And it's too bad to me that it isn't what we all hoped it would be. Unfortunately, this whole like doom saying that I'm doing is kind of what I talk about in my book. But it's sort of funny sometimes, so I'm not, it's not, you're not gonna cry when you read it. But to me, it is a little disappointing that Sports are never, have, or have never been quite as pure as we all wish they could be. Uh, who has a good question? Because I'm, I'm tired. I went pretty long on that one question, though, by the way, right? <laughs> I, was, I feel like that was impressive. What was your adjustment years before you fell off? He asked, how many years do you have to play in the NBA before you qualify for the pension? Good question. Very <coughs> materialistic. Very American of you. I've been in, I've been in Spain for the last year, so I'm not used to thinking about such things. In Spain, they're like, I just, you know, make enough money to drink some wine and go to the beach, and then I die someday. That's all they think about. That's not, there's, beyond that, nothing. Uh, you have to play, or you have to, in the NBA, you have to get three years of service, but that means that you have to be 
in, I'm not sure if it's in uniform or at least on the bench for the equivalent of 82 games times three. Do the math on that for me real fast. 80 times, 82, I'm not asking you. 82 <laughs> times three. Come on, give me a number. Nothing, nothing. Again, we're not you. Let's go. We're trying to get the youth of the nation to learn multiplication. Anybody? Anybody? No? Here? 82 times 3? 82 times 3? Here, Snow Valley. He's got no idea. He's a, a jock. He's a jock. Just, <laughs> he's like me. Just, just a disaster. Yeah. What was that? 246. 246, that's right. Sorry, guys, I mean, let's pay attention to the math. No, no. Yeah, well, it's okay. But you didn't, if you thought I said 23, you should have thrown out an answer at least, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a good try. I admire that, that excuse making, but it's all right. So anyway, you have to then be uh, around for 246 games, which means I'm going to give you another chance here. Listen up for a second. Okay. You have to be in, what did we say, 246 games. I've played in, I think, um, this number is an approximation, about 43 games. <laughs> so how many games short of the NBA pension plan? This is the best word problem in the history of word problems. So, uh, there, you need to have 246. I've played in 43. How many more games do I need? 203, very good. Nice, round of applause right here. So at age 30, with two knee, knee surgeries in my past, one ankle surgery, and a complete disdain for professional basketball, I need to play in 203 more basketball games in the NBA. So is this going to happen? The answer is no, probably not. So I'm going to have to work for the rest of my life like everybody else in this room. I mean, not quite like, like, the good thing about playing in the NBA is they pay you pretty well. Like, I have made more money than I should have. Not as much as you might think. But I can, like, survive for two or three years now. Again, the Spanish lifestyle, like, drink wine, go to the beach, that sort of thing, for two or three years. So I, that makes, I, you probably hate me for that, but don't hate me too much, because it's not like I can survive for 40 years doing that. It's just <laughs> two or three years that I can do that. Yes, sir. Good question. <laughs> he, asked, he asked if I was ever going to use my engineering degree from Iowa State. Kids, engineering, boring. I mean, <laughs> it's good. It's back there, back there in the back. Engineering is boring. I'm sorry. Don't do it. Uh, it's, you know what, though? Your parents will be really proud of you if you do it. That's pretty much why I started it, I think. I was like, I, would, I went to high school, like everyone. And uh, my physics teacher was like, hey, you're good at math and science, be an engineer. And I was like, what does an engineer do? We don't know. <laughs> good question. So I did it, because I'm stupid. And I thought that was, you know, they're like, well, you can make like $40,000 coming out of college, D sign me up. They don't tell you that it, again, barring. And here's the other thing, there aren't any girls there. No, <laughs> no. zero. There are some ugly ones, but no, I mean, you, no. <laughs> They're not, they're not like, they're not like the Oh, so now we're like, yeah, engineering girls are hot. That's, that's what you're telling me? That's what that boo was? Right. Good, good. Okay, I see where we are. So we hate Kobe Bryant. We think that girls in engineering are good looking, right? Uh, so I have a degree in engineering from Iowa State. I'm not sure why I did it. I think at the time I didn't really know what I wanted to do. We were talking at dinner, actually, supper, as we say in Kansas and you maybe say here in Iowa, um, about how now in America, like, there's this, this kind of idea that everybody has to pick when they're 19 years old, which is sort of unfortunate because I feel like we should all have a chance to, like, decide for a little while, especially because our parents worked really hard and made enough money so that we can, you know, lollygag around and do that sort of thing. I, at 19, had no idea what I wanted to do. I, I picked the hardest thing I could think of and said, well, if I screw that up, I can always fall back on something else. And again, also, well, they make $40,000 a year coming out of college, so what, what's wrong with that? The answer to your question, I don't know. I could see myself going back to grad school someday, um, but I probably need to get a start on that because I don't want to be like the creepy old guy. I'm already, I would be the creepy old guy <laughs> in college, but I don't want to be like the creepiest old guy <laughs> in college. I just want to be like mid-level creepy when I go back to school. So if that's going to happen, I need to 
get some things started quickly. I would like to ask you, uh, we know your opinion of Kobe Bryant and we know your opinion of uh, Kevin Garrett, but uh, can you ha do you have a favorite five people that you know in basketball and then a favorite that you don't? <laughs> At least, <find>? yeah. <laughs> He asked, he asked if I had a favorite, like, five guys that, I, that I've met in basketball. Um, and the ones you don't like. And the ones, well, I mean, the, the, I don't, I'm not going to just, like, continue to kick people, throw people under the bus. I wasn't, I wasn't a fan of Phil Jackson, actually. Kind of, which is weird because you'd think, like, kind of smart guys who grew up in the Midwest, like, we should be bosom buddies or something. But, um, Kind of uh, arrogant, I guess is the right word. But we're not gonna again. We don't want to like spew hatred. That's not why we're here. I'll talk about the guys I do like. Steve Nash, amazing human being, like really down to earth. And you kind of, I mean, we all have to root for the little tiny guy who's only only six three, right? Like that's the thing people forget. Like I'm really tall. Like stand up right now. I'm sorry. I didn't mean I didn't mean to order you around. Like this is a normal size like human child, and I'm. <laughs> Much taller than he is. Thank you for. What's your name? Sorry, Austin. Austin. It's nice to meet you, Austin. Thank you, Austin. Um, but you forget that, like, if I am really tall, then even the point guards, the little guys, they're still really tall. They would have been like, for example, when when my dad would come to get me from school when I was in kindergarten, the kids would be like, "Oh my God, your dad is so tall." My dad's six two. So imagine when I have kids and I go to kindergarten, they'll be like, "Your dad." isn't the same species as me. <laughs> so that's going to be awesome. Um, Steve Nash, great guy. Uh, Sharif Abdul Rahim, I mentioned this, I think, in the book. Like, really, really good guy. Um, there's a guy named Walter McCarty, who you probably don't know the name of. Plays the piano, like, into cool music. Like, good, just I, one of the few people who I could sit on the bench with and, like, kind of joke about the girls in the crowd or whatever. Like, he was just a normal person. There are, there are a lot of guys in the NBA who are just not normal, and part of the reason for that is they have no concept of how to relate to other people. Like, they've been coddled from age 14, I think. And so that removes, relieves them of the pressure to actually, like, carry on a conversation or get shot down by a girl because, like, they have never had to deal with that because they've been basically famous since they were in seventh grade. And so the problem with that is, like I said, I mean, I'm this guy from Kansas who was in 4-H and an Eagle Scout. Again, dork. Like, <laughs> Eagle Scout, not, it's not a, not a good way to get girls. It is when you're older, and then they're like, oh, you're an Eagle Scout. That's really cute. But when you're in eighth grade, not the secret to success. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I did all these things, and I, I was in, at middle school dances and petrified by girls and, you know, sweaty at the wrong times and, and all these other things. And most of these guys, if they were, they never admitted it because it was a sign of weakness. And m some of them probably never weren't because they're just that confident in their abilities. And so we never, most of the time, never saw eye to eye. A lot of the best guys that I've been around are guys I met in the minor leagues, like, um, Ryan Sears, anybody know Ryan Sears played at Drake? Like, Iowa kid, right? Like, great guy. Derek Grimm, who played at Missouri. Like, great guy who I'm still friends with now these days. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, unfortunately, some of the most fun I've had playing basketball is, has been in the minor leagues. I say unfortunately because they paid us like $700 a week and we lived in like a Motel 6 in Yakima, Washington, which is, again, not the best way to impress girls. <laughs> Next question. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but people left, and I feel like I just feel frustrated. Like I've I've failed them. It, it just walked out. And, uh, Jesus. Okay. Give me some warning if you're gonna leave. Be like, Paul, you suck. I'm gone. Um, uh, referees, NBA. Uh, his question was: There is there is a current scandal that I think came out today about referees in the NBA. I don't pay much attention, and again, I'm sort of jet lagged from getting back to Spain, so I don't know the full story. But I'll say this about the NBA in general: 
it is a circus. It is closer to professional wrestling <coughs> than people realize. Like, <laughs> there is a reason. I'm not suggesting that there is a, that there is a cause for the Celtics playing the Lakers, which is like <laughs> eerily similar to 20 years ago. And by the way, the NBA is losing out its fan base, especially of white people who buy things and will watch commercials. But and so now the Lakers are playing the Celtics. Weird. Um, I'm not going to say that like that was orchestrated or whatever, but there have been things that happen that are just really suspicious to get certain teams, players, whatever, to go in the right place. Again, I have not been in like a referees meeting where they're like, yeah, we're going to screw over Paul Shirley tonight, but <laughs> not that they would ever say that because they'd have to like come over to the bench and call fouls on me while I was sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> and, I feel like somebody would have noticed that. They'd have been like, that's... <laughs> That's not cool. You can't call fouls on him. He's not playing. That's not acceptable. Um, so again, I'm not again not saying that I know of any knowledge of this, but all professional sports are basically circuses. The business isn't necessarily the Phoenix Suns or the Boston Celtics. The business is the NBA as a whole, and that league or that particular entity is always trying to make money. And the best way that they can do that is for certain things to happen. Again, I don't know, but. Uh, these things become suspicious when you're a player and you start to see how things work. You understand that it's not the pure seventh grade game that I first played in and I think made the first basket of my career in the wrong team's basket, which was <laughs> cool. So yeah, it's, uh, it's always a little suspicious. Yes? Who are your favorite writers? Who are my favorite writers? Good question. We were talking about this at supper as well. Um, I think I've decided that my favorite writer is Richard Russo. Um, but my general influences, like growing up, kind of range from the aforementioned like Hardy Boys when I was really a kid, to then reading like Tom Clancy novels, and then realizing like, well, these are kind of the same when I was about 18 years old, <laughs> uh, or reading again John Grisham and be like, well, these are interesting for my 17-year-old mind, but you know, let's move it on past that. Um, now Chuck Palahniuk, Brett Easton Ellis. Um, Dickens, which sounds very pretentious. I know, like, oh, my favorite author is Charles Dickens. Like, great. <laughs> but Charles Dickens is hilarious if you really, like, pay attention. He says really funny things. And I kind of, I relate to authors who can be funny without necessarily trying to, because life is funny. Like, there's so, uh, we, the more we can talk about all of these things that, that make us laugh because we're insecure about them, whether they be, um, money, power, sex, or gastric dysfunction. Like, the more that we can talk about those things, I think the more comfortable we all are. And the reason that, that it's interesting to talk about that stuff a lot of the times is that it's funny. Um, if I can talk about the fact that I've failed and failed and failed at basketball, but still, like, each time picked myself up, like, a lot of, along the way, there is some humor in that, in the idea that I wanted these things so badly, and then airballed three free throws in the same game one time. Like, how ridiculous is that? That's just, that's not acceptable again. But if, if we can laugh about that, then I think we can deal with it. So I relate really well to authors who have that kind of ability to, to see things in a different way than the rest of us, I guess. Yeah? NCAA tournament, Michigan State, right. Sergeant Hall. Right, good question. We were, I, I talked, I spoke earlier today to the Wells Fargo like business group, which is always a, by the way, which is a strange phenomenon, like talking to two kind of similar groups in the same day, because I always have this running commentary of like, did you already say that, Paul? Did you, did, was it funny? Was it, like, did it, was it terrible? And so you try to like not repeat yourself, which is a terrible idea, because then you're just, anyways, I shouldn't have said any of that, because it's like letting you see behind the curtain. <laughs> Again, I'm st stupid. Um, after that, some guys came up and were like, so Michigan State, uh, Iowa State, was it a block or a charge? I don't know. What he's referring to, when I was a junior in, in college, we were a second, a two seed, right, in the NCAA tournament, and probably one of the better teams in the country. We, were, we had Jamal Tinsley and Marcus Pfizer, these very good basketball players, for those of you not familiar necessarily with Iowa State basketball history. Um, in this game, which was to go to the Final Four, which is a big deal, again, for you non-basketball folk. Um, which, by the way, I would, quick aside, if I was not 6'10 and happened to be blessed with the ability to like jump really well and run, 
I would not be a jock. Like, I would be the dorky kid in the back, like, making fun of the jocks for sure. So I relate to people. Anybody here who doesn't know what I'm talking about? I actually probably understand you better than maybe the jock type. <laughs> so they're, they're like, what happened, what happened? I've never seen a replay of that game or call or anything. I have no idea. It's so, it's like so distant in my memory. No offense to Iowa State fans, but there are so many games that have happened since then that I, I can remember the fact that we lost and that on the day I went back to college after that game, it was a Monday, I walked, I had dealt with the pain of losing. I was, I was pretty emotional and like took things pretty hard. I had, had dealt with like the, the fact that my season was over and what was gonna become of my career after this. I still had another year, but again, tended to like exaggerate things in my brain. Uh, and, and had gotten through this over the weekend, walked to the newspaper stand on the campus at breakfast, pick up a newspaper, and there on the front page, the full first half of the front page is a picture of me crying. <laughs> Which, <laughs> side note, also not a good way to get girls. Uh, unless, unless they're like the really sensitive artsy types, then maybe. Um, quick side note from that. Can you imagine that a girl, not attractive, had the gall to ask me to sign that during the day when I was walking around? <laughs> I was in the library and she's like, could you autograph this picture of you crying? <laughs> really? Um, so anyway, uh, I've, I've, I've never watched that. I think that was enough trauma for me at the time, um, being the guy. Before I was known as the guy who writes about his professional career and ruins his chances of playing in the NBA again, I was known as the guy who cried a lot, which I, I'm not sure if that's a, I guess it's a step up, right? Like, you don't want, nobody dude wants to be known as the guy who cries, right? That's not that cool. So I guess I'd be rather the guy who submarine his career. No. He, he asked, he stated for the record, fellow dork was in 4-H, like me. <laughs> Power to the nerds who got made fun of. Um, he was asking if I picked up any languages while I've been overseas. I've played in Greece, Spain, and Russia. I mean, I've been headquartered in those places. I've played in like ridiculous places like Poland and Macedonia and Tel Aviv and all these other places too, but I've only been headquartered in those. Um, I remember about five words of Greek, uh, two words of Russian that aren't curse words, and my Spanish, I, th I think I speak about one-ninth of Spanish, unfortunately. Like, I'm not good with languages. I think we Americans are just bad at languages. I don't know why, maybe because we're not taught them from young age, or maybe because of the chlorine in our water, I, I don't know. But no, I'm terrible with languages, unfortunately. Yes. Of all the places you've lived, what's your favorite from a cultural perspective? He asked, I'm sure you heard him, because <laughs> impressive voice from back there. Um, of all the places I've lived, what's my favorite from a cultural standpoint, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, let's see. Uh, let's, I'm going to give you the positives. Greece, uh, cool, like, if you want to see old archaeological stuff and girls with unibrows, we've got those. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Russia is good if you want to drink a lot and see girls who look like prostitutes. <laughs> Spain is good if you like to eat food that's in constantly infused with crap like mussels and scallops and that sort of thing. And short girls, lots of short girls there. Um, from a cultural standpoint, Barcelona is my favorite city that I've been in the world probably. Um, maybe has its disadvantages now because it's become kind of a tourist hotbed, but really cool place. Get the chance, go there, and I might still be there, so like, <laughs> give me a holler. <laughs> question here. Did you ever think about being a coach? She asked, astute question, have I ever thought about being a coach? Uh, I've hated most of my coaches and I never wanted to become someone I hated, so <laughs> I probably, probably not. No, actually, I mean, I did hate a lot of my coaches, but in all seriousness, I want to get out of basketball at some point. I don't, I have loved the fact that I've gotten paid to play a game, but I also see how ridiculous that is and kind of want to get away from it at some point. 
I would coach for, say, Tim Floyd because I respect him greatly. Um, Tim Floyd coached at Iowa State when I first got here, for those that don't know. Um, now coaches at Southern California and I think pays players to go there, which is cool. <laughs> whatever. Um, but. What I could, yes, exactly. That's, I mean, I see this in my life. She said, you could coach the Boy Scouts. Well, I see myself, like, maybe when I'm 55, like, taking over a high school team, like, maybe sort of, I'm not sure if it'll be, like, more Dennis Hopper style, or I'm, I'm thinking, like, Dennis Hopper and Hoosiers, where I'm, like, drunk and stumbling the sidelines, <laughs> or if it's more of, like, Gene Hackman, like, polished, hard nose. We'll see what, with the rest of my life what happens. Enough breakups, and maybe it'll be Dennis Hopper, like, things go well. It's more... The other one, Gene Hackman. Uh, right. Um, he asked, after I signed the book deal to, to write this book with Random House, um, ESPN called, their website called, and asked if I wanted to contribute every now and then to their <laughs> website. And again, they said, that we'll pay you to do it. And I was like, well, I was going to write it anyway. I might as well get paid to do it. So that was cool. Um, he asked if I would continue to kind of cultivate that, maybe do radio, TV, something like that. I could see that happening. Uh, it's a pretty natural transition, I think. Um, but I don't know. I think I would get tired pretty quickly about if, if I had to talk about basketball all the time. Because again, I, I don't want to sort of degrade sports or professional sports or whatever, but when I've seen so much of it, it gets to be dull because it, gets, it sort of follows a certain pattern after a while. But yeah, maybe. Would you listen to me if I spoke on the radio? Would that be, would you guys? I was, it wasn't it's a, it's a yeah, it's, as long as I don't, as long as I don't compete with Larry, who, by the way, great plug for his own show. He's like, and uh, this is, hi, my name's Larry, and uh, I'm on every day at six, so check me out. <laughs> it's, it's very smooth, very smooth. Right? Tell us about that. Okay, yes. Um, there are people are leaving in droves now. Got to pick it up, Shirley. <laughs> pick it up. Pick it up. Uh, God, if only I were a hot girl, this would be easier. Um, when, I, when I was approached about writing the book, I, was, I, I decided, as I, I told you, my agent was kind of horning in on, on my book deal. So I was like, maybe I should get a literary agent. I didn't know anything, how do you get a literary agent? Like that's, uh, how, that's like asking someone who's not got a girlfriend like to go get married. Like how do you make that transition from not having a literary agent to getting one? I called the only people I knew in Los Angeles, which was the only thing I could think of doing, and my aunt and uncle said, oh yeah, we know an agent, he lives right across the street. Because everybody knows an agent in Los Angeles, that's like saying, yeah, I mow my grass. Uh, obviously you know an agent. So they, they talked to this agent fellow who happened to be with William Morris, which is a kind of high-powered agency in Los Angeles and New York. Only problem was he was a television agent, which was fine by me because after he hooked me up with a literary agent who signed the book or got the book deal for me, he said, why don't you come up with an idea for a TV show? And I said, okay, let me think about it. How about um, sort of a self-deprecating white guy who doesn't play very much and sits at the end of the bench, talks about his career. What do you think of that? He's like, that's genius. And I'm like, yeah, I'm really smart, <laughs> as it turns out. <laughs> so that worked out pretty well. Um, we then took that idea to, or not we, he, in doing his agenting thing, whatever that is, took this idea to the various networks, the NBCs and whatever. We then wrote this pilot for Fox. Everybody knows what a pilot is. It's the first show of a television show, like Seinfeld, ER. All these shows had a pilot, which turns out to be the first show that is t shown on television. But before you get to that stage, you make the, the producers, blah, 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 make the pilot to basically audition the show for the uppity ups with Fox. And they say, well, yeah, it's OK, but it's not funny enough. Or yeah, there's not enough cleavage shown, so we can't really show it on Fox or whatever. So <laughs> we. We made a pilot, which was basically like, look at us. This is what we can do. Will you put us on TV? And maybe we can all become millionaires due to the residuals someday. Um, the process of doing this was obviously arduous, as you can imagine, because they don't just like give away this money. They say that 
of every 100 shows that are given the go-ahead to write the script, which is a pretty big deal, even that, only 10 or 12 of them are ever made. And of those 10 or 12, only two or three are ever picked up and actually put on television. When I say picked up, that means they say, OK, we'll sign you to a deal to do 13 episodes or 22 episodes or whatever. So things got rolling pretty well. Like We got, we got the, the right people. We hired a guy named Tim Story, who directed the movie Barbershop and the movie Fantastic Four, which made me say, like, what is this guy going to do with basketball? How does he know anything? I, don't, I didn't understand that, but whatever. They, get, they don't ask me my opinion at that point. They're just like, yeah, shut up. You don't know. Um, we got a, an executive producer named Dan Fogelman who wrote the movie Cars. You guys know that movie, the animated. And the movie Fred Claus, which I think was a good idea that sucked for some reason that came out this year. Um, so we got these people, got people excited about it, got to go ahead to then make the pilot, which was a big deal. At the same time that all this was happening, I was playing for a team in Los Angeles that was a Chinese professional team that happened to be playing in America, which is sort of like typical to the Paul Shirley story. It couldn't just be a normal team. It had to be like 12 Chinamen and me playing <laughs> basketball. Like, why, why wouldn't that be in my life? Like, that's normal. This didn't really work out. Like, the, it turned out that these, the, the Chinese team, here's a quick aside, which I'm pretty good at. Um, not that I'm good at them, I'm good at making them. Um, this team, I'm, I'm playing for this team, and I realized that like, the substitution patterns are really strange. I eventually find out that there is a person in the stands, a woman, on the cell phone talking to an owner in China who's watching the game on television. The owner tells the woman in the stands to make substitution. She walks to the player and says, hey, you go in for Xing Hu. And the guy just walks past the coach who's sitting there like, <laughs> and subs himself into the game. And as you can imagine, that got a little old after a while. So anyway, that didn't really work out. And I kind of went full time to like sitting in an office on the Fox lot, which was kind of cool. First time I've ever had an office. And cool things happened, like we had to audition a dance team, for example. We needed a dance team for this basketball team that we were having. So us being kind of unafraid of everything, we call up the Lakers and the Clippers and say, hey, can your, your, your dance teams want to come audition for us so that they can maybe be on TV? And they're like, yeah, whatever. We'll do that. So they send their dance teams. And we hold an audition for the dance teams in the parking lot at, on the Fox lot. Like, we're, we're playing music out of the back of the director's car. And these, girl, these poor girls are dancing for their little, like, lives in the parking lot while we stand there and go, like, yeah, that one's too fat. She can't be on. Like, no, you've got to get out. Just, that's not going to work. In the end, we picked the Clippers girls, much more enthusiastic than the slightly lo better looking Lakers girls, just for future reference. Um, so we go through this process. I should note that when they gave us the go-ahead to write the pilot, they said, OK, Paul, we know that you don't have any training. You've never wanted to do this. But we want you to act in the show, or at least try to. And I'm like, well, no. And then they're like, well, come on. And I said, OK, that sounds fun. <laughs> So they said, all you have to do is go for basically six weeks and work with an acting coach. Again, kind of ridiculous. Like, I've never been an actor, never planned to be an actor, never even thought that acting was the real live profession. But whatever, might as well try. So they assigned me this woman who's like the coolest human being in the world. Her name was Eva, and she was about that tall, this 55-year-old Jewish lesbian whose parents were communists or something like. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying like communists. They were actual communists and kind of weird, but like the greatest human being ever like taught me all these things about the world and blah, blah, blah. I, she was like my own little Yoda, basically. Like she's, <laughs> she just sort of followed me around. And it was funny because I was, I guess if she was Yoda, then I was probably more like Chewbacca, which is not <laughs> like the coolest guy in Star Wars. But still, he was in Star Wars, so that, that makes him interesting. Um, so they, she teaches me how to act, and she does a pretty good job. And as it turns out, I'm not bad at it. Like, again, I should note, though, that I'm acting as myself. So <laughs> maybe I wasn't so good at it as much as I was just, like, you know, breathing, basically. <laughs> but I, I, I kind of learned some tricks along the way, and, and people said I was doing a good job. The strange thing about this, though, was as a producer, I was watching auditions for these various parts. Kind of cool, because. We got to see 
interesting people. I think someone died in the hallway. That's, <laughs> let's check into that. Um, we got to see some, some cool people. Who played the original Shaft? Anybody know the answer? Shaft. Richard Roundtree. Yes, exactly. He auditioned to be the coach of this basketball team, which is pretty cool. I was not a big Shaft fan, but still interesting. Um, auditioned at one point, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Wait, oh man, this is <laughs> bad for self-esteem. All right, guys, see ya. I'm gonna try to shake this off. Uh, uh, rough. Seriously, did you have to take them all at the same time? You couldn't have been like, okay, three of you go, and then four of you go. Or you could have been like, you, ask if he can go to the bathroom, and then just don't come back. Um, okay, so anyway, God, it's, I, 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 this is, it'd be tough to be like a real entertainer and just have people booing you or something. That'd be <laughs> terrible. So anyway, one of the people we auditioned to be the coach was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And imagine this, if you will. I'm a professional basketball player. It's my dream to score lots of points in, in professional basketball games. I think I've scored, mm, I'm not sure. My career high is six, I think, in the NBA. And I think I've maybe scored like <clears throat> 39 points total or something like that. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is either the leading or second leading, second, second behind Jordan, I think. Second all-time leading scorer in professional basketball. Like Hall of Famer, multiple time, all-star, all this sort of thing. And basically he's sitting there auditioning to be the coach, asking me for a job. That's a little strange little <laughs> paradox, right? Problem is, he's a terrible actor, just bad. Like, didn't have a chance, no chance at all. So anyway, this is cool. We're like meeting these, these interesting people and, I'm, and we get to like audition just strange humans constantly and, and that was fun. The problem was that we had to audition people to play the part that is essentially me, yet I'm competing for this part of essentially me. So I'm wanting the show to be good, but I'm also like kind of competitive and I don't want to lose to these just random dudes who are trying to be me. <laughs> since I figure I'm pretty good at being me, so why shouldn't I play that part? <laughs> it comes down, we audition, you know, 200 guys probably for the part of quasi Paul Shirley. It comes down to this other guy who was famous for being on Bud Light commercials and stuff, good guy, went to like Truman State or something like that, uh, and me for this part. And I'm going through like these screen tests where they put makeup on you and all this. Note to guys, makeup kind of makes you look good, which makes you sound a little gay, but like it's amazing. You can cover up a lot of blemishes with that stuff. It's kind of nice for a change. I see the secret that girls have. Um, so I'm, I'm, Larry knows about these things because he's been on TV for sure. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. I mean, makeup, you're like, wow, I look, I look okay right now. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so it comes down to the two of us, and long story short, they pick, they say that this dude who's trying to audition to play the part of me is better at being me than I am at being me, <laughs> which it's a shock that I didn't kill myself, right? Like, good job, Paul, for not shooting yourself in the head. Um, in the end, we made this show, and it was kind of funny, like, it was not as biting maybe as some of the stuff I say. It was a little watered down from network television. And we got wrapped up in this whole like romantic thing between the lead character and the daughter of the GM who was gonna take over the GM spot, which is blatantly ridiculous, but like, you gotta go for ratings, right? Like, that's how it works. So anyway, the show didn't get picked up. It lost out to the Brad Garrett project, the name of show I can't remember. Does any, there's a show with Brad, Brad Garrett in it. Can anybody tell me the name of it? What is it? Maybe? No, that's not it. Someone. It's on Fox. Tall guy from Everybody Loves Raymond. Obviously a popular show. Yeah, I can see why it beat ours. Like, makes a lot of sense that that one won. Um, so the, the upshot of all this, what? Till death. Till death. I think that's the one, yeah. One person out of 200 knew the name. Yes. That's great. Makes me feel good. Like, we really lost out to um, the next Seinfeld. Um, the upshot to all this is, A, I have a 26-minute pilot that I can show people and they can be like, ooh, that's pretty cool. Sub-A in that same little paragraph, 
I got to play, just as a bit part, not, this isn't the reason that we, I show the, the thing to people, but I get to play, instead of myself, which would be logical, I play my own father to a made up version of me in a television show. <laughs> The, the number two of this, the good thing that we, that we managed through this, even though we didn't get to put the, the show on air, we spent three and a half million dollars of Fox's money, which is awesome. So, <laughs> good job, us. <laughs> Lots of free meals while I'm sitting there in the editing room like, no, that shot of the side of her face looks terrible. Let's try the left side. Like, really important, just life-saving work we were doing. Uh, Let's have another question. Yes, back there. Wait, Iowa State shirt. Do you have any thoughts regarding the book? I'm sure that's happening. Girls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, so we got, we got one that says, um, one lovely lady over here says, do you have thoughts of writing another book? Second says, it's gotta be about girls. <laughs> no, I, again, remember, dorky guy. No luck with girls. So it's a boring book. <laughs> uh, okay, do I have thoughts of writing another book? Uh, yes, I do. Actually, you have to bear with me because this is like typical, oh, we write a nonfiction book. Now he wants to write fiction. Great. Um, I started some fiction this year when I was in Menorca, which is a great place to write fiction because it's sort of depressing and there's nothing else to do. Um, to answer your question, I, will hope, I would hope that I get the opportunity to write more books. I don't want to write like, this one was called Can I Keep My Jersey? I don't want to write, Can I Keep My Shorts? And Can I Keep My Shoes? And like, <laughs> can, I, can I keep that random pom pom over there? Like, I don't, I do not want to see you guys in 10 years talking about me playing in Menorca. Like, that's just not, I'm not interested in doing that. But I really would like to try writing fiction and explore. I think there are cool things to say about like, guys my age from the Midwest who don't really understand exactly how their lives work and take it from there. Well, I think we have time for one more question, according to my savant back there in the back. Yes? Uh, how, how hard was it to kind of choose one since you started doing this with them and kind of not be all in the same box? Very, that's a, this, normally, here's how it happens. You say, like, last question, and you're thinking that it's going to be some, like, grand question like that, very deep and profound. It'll be like, what size shoe do you wear, dude? <laughs> Uh, so, thank you. She asked, uh, what, was it tough to go through all these trials and tribulations, make it to the NBA, and then realize that it really wasn't quite what you expected it would be? Which is a very true statement, because people now ask me a lot, well not a lot, I mean a little bit, if I want to get back to the NBA. If I say to you, nah, I don't, I'm not really that interested in playing in the NBA anymore, I'm kind of over it. Your first thought is, oh, sour grapes, he can't make it back. He's not, he doesn't care about getting to the NBA. Or he, no, that's not true. Sour grapes, he would love to get to the NBA, but he's trying to pretend that he doesn't care. I really don't care if I get back to the NBA because I've seen all that. I know that it is cool to fly around in a charter plane and it's cool to stay in, in Ritz-Carlton hotels. And when I say it's cool, I mean that it's fun and interesting, and, but you quickly realize that there's a lot more to life than going to practice I wouldn't say hating, but disliking most of the people you're around every day, and then going home and not thinking about those people again. It would be a lot more fun if I could hang out with those people, have real conversations with them, joke about the fact that I'm terrible with girls or whatever. Um, those things, that would be cool if, if, I could, if I could have that. And it has been tough, because for as long as I can remember, my only dream was to play in the NBA. Like, I didn't tell people that because it sounded ridiculous. I was sort of insecure. And you tell people that you want to play in the NBA and you're a white kid from Meriden, Kansas, they're like, yeah, okay, sure. Um, and I want to be you know, a fisherman in Alaska. Like that, that's, it's, it's just absurd to say those things. But all along, I'm harboring these dreams of someday I'm going to be like Larry Bird. And it's tough, too, that even though I've gotten to these, these high levels of playing basketball, which I probably never should have gotten because, again, I'm this, this kid from Kansas. I'm never going to have Larry Bird's career. And that's okay, though. Because for me, I know that I did everything I could to make this happen. Everything I could. I mean, 
when I was in college, I did never drink. I rarely went out. I spent so much time thinking about not just college, but getting to that next step. I never told people that because I was afraid they would laugh at me, which was kind of stupid and insecure. And you should probably maybe let on that you have cool dreams because that doesn't make you like a terrible human being. But all along, I was hoping that I would get that far. And even though I've accomplished only scoring however, whatever minimal points I said that I scored, what was it, Austin, you remember? Like 35, something just terrible? 43, something like that, yeah. <laughs> something tragic and bad. Even though that's all I've ever accomplished, I am perfectly content because I know that I tried as hard as I could to get to that. And I know that even though my book isn't like the best thing you'll ever read, and it was in some ways maybe not the best book that I could have written if I had waited 10 years and gotten better at writing and whatever. It was the best book that I could write at the time, knowing what I knew. And, and that's pretty cool. Like, I, I can stand here and say that while I've failed many, 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 many times, I've, I've been cut, I've been literally kicked to the ground when I had Austin Crozier's knee in my side and he put me in the hospital with a ruptured knee, kidney and spleen for a while. Like, even though those things happened, I wouldn't trade any of it because I've gotten to do these things and I had the chance to try really hard at something. I think most of us, unfortunately, have to settle for something that we didn't necessarily dream about, whether it's working at the pawn shop or the liquor store or becoming a prostitute. Although I doubt we have any prostitutes in the audience. I'm not accusing anyone <laughs> here of prostitution. That is not my goal. Like most of us don't necessarily get those opportunities. And I have, and that's, that's for all my snide, cynical remarks and self-deprecation, it's pretty cool that I've gotten to try my best at putting a ball in a hoop. And thank you for that, I guess. Madam. <laughs> <laughs>